right, so hello everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Alex from the Molecular and Genomics Informatics Corps. Uh, we also have Luke and Karen from the uh, Cellular Imaging and Histology Corps, you know, our imaging wizards around here. Uh, we also have Aaron from the Glencoe team. Um, before I just cast, pass it over to you know, Karen and Aaron, um, just general you know, housekeeping items. If you have any questions, put them in the chat or the Q&A box, and we will you know, either answer them live or save them for the end. Um, and we'll get to everything uh, at one point or another. So Karen, just real quick for you. Great, thanks so much. Um, I, just, I think one of the reasons we wanted to really highlight um, Omero and all these other options is that, you know, especially when we think about data storage for imaging, um, we have our new slide scanner, we have, you know, a lot of capabilities to do, um, to acquire very large data sets, whether that be through STED or through time-lapse microscopy. And, you know, it's really, you know, it becomes an issue of how do you store all this data? How do you make it readily accessible um, instead of having to shuffle large hard drives all over the place. Um, and so, and especially with the new NIH data management, um, things that are coming up, we really need to think about how we're going to store these large format images. And I think, you know, that the presentation that we'll hear today really kind of begins to answer and address some of those, um, those obstacles that I think we currently face. So I look forward to hearing more from Aaron. Great. Thanks so much. That's such a great introduction to frame the problem that we'll be talking about today. So thanks so much. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate everyone joining and the opportunity to talk to everyone today about some of the work that we do at Glencoe Software. So I'm going to introduce um, Omero Plus, uh, Bioformats and PathViewer, and how they can be used for integrated image data management and analysis. Um, so as I said, my name is Erin Deal. Um, I'm the head of product for Glencoe Software, and I'm really excited to tell you about all the work that we've been doing lately. Okay, so I want to step back first and think about this question of why imaging data is important. Now, this might be silly because probably everyone on this call is using imaging data, but I want to just highlight why the sort of digital image is intrinsically interesting and valuable. Um, so here I have an example of a bright field image um, from the Cancer Genome Atlas, so a public data set, and I'll, I'll zoom in on a particular region here. And I think we all know that a lot of work goes into getting to this point. So there's a lot of um, human hours, uh, time spent and money spent to acquire this image in the first place. And it has a lot of interesting detail to it. But acquiring the image is not the end of the story. So you might, for example, um, do some image analysis where you are segmenting the image. So here, for example, um, someone has found the nuclei versus the other parts of the tissue, which you see segmented in green and blue. And then maybe in all those objects that you found, all the nuclei in this case, you might measure a number of features and do some interesting downstream analysis. And this is what allows you to do your discovery work or even your diagnostic work um, in the clinic to be able to glean really essential information from this image. Um, the problem, though, is that this is great. We can gain a lot of useful information from these images, but imaging data is really challenging to work with. So first, it's multidimensional. So images are frequently five-dimensional. So we're talking about um, space, so X and Y. Uh, we also might be talking about time. Uh, we also might be talking about the number of channels. And so maybe you have an RGB image like the image in the previous slide, but you also might be talking about highly multiplex data sets where you have 10, 20, 30, um, even hundreds of channels in, in your particular image that you've acquired. And this is becoming routine. This is not something exotic or elegant. This is a day-to-day -day workflow of a scientist to acquire that kind of data. This also means that the size of the data sets are quite large. So a single uh, data set could be anywhere from one to 50 terabytes. Uh, one example to put that into perspective is a, a single Netflix two hour video um, is about 14 gigabytes. And, you know, we are, are watching these kinds of videos all the time and we understand the technology that's in place to allow that process to be um, somewhat seamless. And, uh, you know, 14 gigs, well, that's a, a easily an hour's worth of work on the microscope. Um, and so we can acquire much larger data sets in biological imaging, and this presents a, a fairly large challenge. Um, we also know that the images themselves are not assessed in isolation. So we have to consider um, various metadata uh, surrounding those images and also the permissions on who can see those images and the associated metadata. So this might be something like a sample description, um, something that's biologically relevant or clinically, clinically relevant that might uh, come from an electronic lab notebook. 
Um, it also might be something about the acquisitional metadata. So think of a laser power or light intensity. Um, we also know that at various universities or various pharmaceutical companies, there is uh, tight control over who has access to what. So this might be simply that your lab is working on a sensitive publication, but it also meet, might mean that uh, you're a part of some clinical trial and that there's um, certain privacy uh, regulations surrounding um, that data. Um, if you've acquired bioimaging data yourself, you'll know that there's a lot of format diversity. So if you use two different scanners um, from two different vendors, they will have a different file format that they write out, and those are typically proprietary file formats. Now, these are defined by, defined by the vendors, and there's good reason for that. They're trying to write data as efficiently as possible. So it's not as if they're doing it for some antagonistic purpose. Um, there's a real value to being able to write microscopy data really quickly. Um, but this means that those uh, files are not interoperable um, with other with various um, analysis or visualization platforms that you might be working with um, in a single vendor space. And um, that means that it's also hard to scale the way that you work with this data, um, not only because if you try and build, say, an analysis pipeline for one uh, data format, it doesn't necessarily translate to another, um, but also because these files are just not fundamentally meant for scalable image analysis, as one example. They're meant for writing data as quickly as possible. That's what they're streamlined for. We also know that the bioimaging space is full of innovation, which is really fabulous, but it means that there's a fairly rapid development of new techniques, new analysis tools, and so it's a challenging domain to keep up with. Um, and on that note, we need to be flexible. So we need to be able to adapt to those changing methods, but we also need to be able to adapt to changing policies. So going back to that question of permissions, um, what are maybe new rules and regulations surrounding the data that we're working with? So Glencoe Software as a company is tasked with um, helping groups manage, integrate, share, and analyze their imaging data, and most importantly, at scale. So talking about these large volumes of data institution-wide and how we allow the effective management of this data. Um, you can see uh, in the little circles there a variety of different kinds of imaging that we're, um, that we're seeing in, in these various sites uh, that we work with. Um, those are just a few examples. And when we do this, when we do this data management, we're doing it um, frequently on premises, sometimes in the cloud, sometimes hybrid solutions. And this is crossing both uh, sort of discovery work and diagnostic work. And so we end up uh, doing a lot of different things with imaging data with our customers um, across the different sites in which we work on uh, the data management challenge. And so now I want to go into uh, specifically our solutions, and I'll go back to those challenges that I described in terms of why bioimaging data is, is so hard to work with and how our solutions try and address those problems. So first, I just want to name uh, the, the three pillars of the solutions that we develop. Um, the first is Omero Plus. Um, this is kind of the heart of all of our solutions. It's the core data management um, uh, interface. And it's what allows you to have both secure and controlled, but also cross-platform access to your data. And this would include both the imaging data and all that metadata that we talked about. Uh, Bioformats is used by Omero Plus in order to smooth out all that format diversity. So this is an image translation library. It's what allows you to work with um, images from different vendors. And importantly, it's a translation library, not a conversion library. So it doesn't require that you convert all your data to a single format. Um, it allows you to keep the images in their original format um, and in real time translate that data. So that's what Omero is using um, on the back end. And then finally, we have Path Viewer. This is a viewer. So this is what, as an end user, you're usually interacting with. Um, this is a browser-based tool. Um, so you open up your Chrome, and I'll actually show you an example of Path Viewer in a moment. Um, and you can look through your um, uh, images and even annotate those images. And this viewer was actually built with digital pathology, large whole slide images in mind. And I'll show you some examples of that kind of data in Path Viewer. OK, so how are we addressing those problems that I just laid out? So first. The idea of images being five dimensional is built into the data model that we use within Omero. So the OME or open microscopy environment data model. And this means that we just have native understanding of those five dimensional data sets. So if you have a huge image in X and Y, if you have a Z dimension to it, if you have time, if you have tens of channels, those are all just natively supported uh, within the platform. And knowing that this means that the data sets get quite large, we use chunking to transmit only the data that we need. 
So if this is in a viewer and you're zoomed in in a particular part of the tissue or you're looking at a particular Z section, then we only send that data to the viewer. Same idea if you're running some analysis, you might be splitting up that image into tiles and analyzing tile by tile and then bringing the results together at the end. And so there's lots of ways to access your data, um, either in the way that our applications are accessing the data or you're doing it yourself with the API um, so that you only get the data that you need. We also store not only the image data, but also the metadata, and we allow you to control access to both the images and the metadata with our permissions model. Um, this is true not only for, uh, say, you're working in the browser and looking through your image data um, and metadata, but also if you're accessing this information via the API. I already mentioned that we use bioformats which handles all this format diversity. Um, we support over 150 different file formats. I also want to highlight briefly that um, if anyone has ever used the format OME TIFF, this is an example of an open file format specification, so one that's not a proprietary file format. Um, and this was developed by the open microscopy environment um, and is pretty broadly used in terms of bioimaging data. And lately, both the Open Microscopy Environment and Glencoe Software have worked to develop the next generation of open file formats, um, which is called OME NGFF. Um, this is not a replacement for OME TIFF. It serves as a sort of an added purpose, um, which is to support cloud native deployments. I'm not going to talk a lot about cloud native deployments today, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have about working with bioimaging data in the cloud. And we've um, written a lot of uh, both published work, uh, sort of peer-reviewed published work and um, blog posts that describe our work with OME and GFF. So I'm happy to send those along as well to anyone interested. Um, we also, uh, knowing the innovation and flexibility needed in this space, the application itself is built in a modular way, in a flexible way, so that you can extend it in the ways that are most important. This might me mean a scalability question. So um, we have a lot of pathologists reviewing data, and that means a lot of image viewing. And so we need to scale the elements of the application that allow you to, um, that are responsible for um, sending tiles to the viewer, for example. Or we're doing a lot of uh, model training, and so we actually want raw data um, that's going to go to our uh, compute cluster. So you can scale the applications in the application in different ways based on the modular construction, but you can also build your own things on top of Omero. And so um, that's something that our team does a lot. We build a lot of integrations, especially lately with uh, various analysis platforms, um, but it's also something that you can do yourself. The API is um, completely open. Um, and then maybe the last example of uh, flexibility is one thing that I kind of already mentioned, that we do our deployments uh, both on-premises and the cloud, and we have some hybrid deployments as well. Okay. So um, I mentioned these various products, and I just want to kind of briefly build a very high-level architecture diagram, because I know that sometimes it's hard to see how these pieces all work together, especially when um, you're thinking as an end user and you're probably going to be interacting with uh, something like PathViewer, viewing your images in a browser. Um, but I think it's helpful to know kind of what's happening behind the scenes with your imaging data um, to understand how this is offering uh, kind of a, a higher level data management platform overall. Um, so at the bottom here, we have uh, four circles that represent four different kinds of imaging. So this maybe reflects the format diversity or at least the domain diversity in the kinds of imaging data that you're producing. And those are in some uh, centralized storage. And so maybe it's the network file share that you, um, you know, write your microscopy data to after the acquisition is complete. Uh, maybe it's some storage in the cloud, but it's some centralized uh, storage at your institution. Now, because these images might all be of different formats, you're going to use bioformats to read that data. You're not uh, converting it permanently. They're staying in their original format. So to say this is an SVS or a CZI or NDPI, they stay that um, on the file system. But you use bioformats to read that data because we have support for over 150 different file formats. Omero Plus is sitting on top of this. And so basically bioformats is in between Omero and the data itself um, in terms of the primary imaging data. And Omero Plus has a number of different components to it, one of which is a database, which is where things like metadata is stored. Um, also, if you've annotated regions of interest or you've done some analytics, this is all going to go in that database. And Omero Plus is aware of what all those images are that are under management. And so the files are maybe not sitting literally in the database, um, but it knows where the files are located. 
this is actually really um, important when we think about analysis integrations because you might have um, some other component that's uh, on sort of the other side of this diagram that needs to access those image files as well. Um, and so you can have lots of different uh, platforms that are interacting with the image files, even if they're under management in Omero, and that makes uh, the workflows really flexible. We tend to do a lot of things with our imaging data, not just put them in a single platform like Omero. Um, and then you can do things with your imaging data via this data management interface of Omero Plus. So this might be a, a human doing something with their data. And so this might be an end user um, interacting with the imaging data in some way, but it also might be a computer interacting with the images. And so maybe it's some analysis script. And so just for some um, examples, sorry for the weird slide transition there. Um, some examples of this on the left side, so it's kind of the human interaction side, is something like Path Viewer, which you'll, you'll see in a moment. I'm in the browser, I'm actually looking at my images, I'm annotating them, or you might be analyzing them in an interactive way in a platform like QPath or VisioFarm or Fiji, et cetera. And so you are accessing your imaging data in those platforms via the data management um, central component of Omero Plus. And then on the right side, the kind of headless version where um, it's a computer that's interacting with your data, not, not you yourself. Um, maybe you have some custom Python or MATLAB script, um, or there are some interactive uh, analysis platforms like Cell Profiler, which can be run in a headless fashion. Um, and so these are all examples of integrations that we've done um, primarily in the image analysis space, um, where via this central uh, data management platform, you can kind of orchestrate scaled image analysis in interesting ways. Okay, so I want to give some specifics on this interface of Path Viewer that I described, um, because really, as an end user, um, you know, there might be some data scientists in the audience who are really thinking about um, scaled image analysis, and I'll show you some examples of um, how we can integrate that in Omero Plus as well. But really, the end user is largely interacting with um, Omero via the browser. And so they're in Omero Web or this viewer that we've added on top of Omero, which is um, Path Viewer. And they're actually, you know, looking through their images, um, maybe from a metadata perspective or in a viewer looking at the pixels themselves. Um, and so I want to show you some examples of the ways that we support that workflow. Okay. So here, what you see are two um, screenshots of Path Viewer. And let's dig into some of the options that you have in Path Viewer in terms of um, visualizing your data, and then I'll show you it live. Um, so in Path Viewer, this is an example, um, again, of that TCGA slide, so that RGB data, so full support for whole slide images um, that are uh, kind of from those slide scanners, RGB, bright field data. Um, and here you see overlaid in the viewer that segmentation example, so that green and blue um, segmentation to find those nuclei. And then as an example, on the right hand side, you have a little bit of metadata, not on the image itself, but actually on those analytics. And so um, in this region that was analyzed, what was, for example, the mean area or the total number of uh, cells that were found? Um, you can also see uh, there's some kind of orienting views uh, here. So in the center panel, you obviously have the image itself, but on the right hand side, you see actually where you are in the image because you're zoomed in to a much larger image. Um, and then on the left hand side, you see a little bit of metadata about the image itself. And so you see the image thumbnail, you see the image name, and you have a couple of what are called tags here. Um, these are to indicate that this image is from the Cancer Genome Atlas, for example, and stage four, that's one of the bits of metadata that came from um, uh, the Atlas as well. Okay. Now, if you're working with fluorescence data, we support that as well. So here is an example of um, a fairly large fluorescence data set where this image has tens of channels on it. Um, and so the central panel obviously looks a little bit different because the imaging data itself looks different, um, but kind of the same overall view here in terms of the bird's eye view on the right. And in the left, I've switched instead of the slides panel, I'm looking at the viewing options panel. And what you see here are not only a, a large number of channels, but you can see that they're grouped. And so we have uh, uh, genes that belong to the immune group or the bleach rounds from imaging. And so this was a, a cyclic um, staining round. And the nice thing about this interface here is not only that you can support tens of channels, okay, that's great, but you can imagine with tens of channels, 
it becomes quite cumbersome to sit and turn on and off of the right channels that you want to visualize. And so if you want to quickly review your DNA stains or your immune stains, um, you can turn on and off particular sets of channels uh, with one click with that little eye icon to the left of each of those group names. And so it just allows you a little bit of organization on top of those channels. And this is just one way that when we build these solutions that are somewhat domain specific, so in this case, very multiplexed um, whole slide images, we try and build tools within the interface that make it easy to work with this data. So knowing that you have tens of channels, what are the ways that uh, I, I don't have a really hard time to just view the three that I want um, for this particular workflow? You can also duplicate um, channels across different groups. Maybe you always want to see your, your nuclear stain in, um, in every channel group that you um, have. So lots of different options there. Um, we also built Path Viewer Grid, which is kind of the uh, partner application to Path Viewer. And this is like many Path Viewers in one. So what it is here is a, a grid, like it sounds like, of uh, multiple Path Viewer windows so that you can view many images side by side and you can synchronize your navigation across the views. And so as you zoom out, zoom in and out and pan around the image, you're, you see the same changes in the other views. And, and I'll show you this live in just a moment. Um, and the nice thing about this is that if you have, for example, serial sections, or maybe you have an H&E image and a fluorescence image, and you want to view them side by side, you can do that. And you can also annotate them at the same time. So if you annotate on one section, and then you want to copy and paste that to all of your views, um, you can do that. And here you have control over the dimensions of this grid. So if you only have two images, you can view those side by side. Or if you have a larger number like here, uh, we support that as well. Um, I also want to highlight that these images, these fluorescent images, are from uh, Jerry Turner's lab out of uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Um, they have a great public instance of Omero Plus uh, where they put published data sets. Okay, so one thing that we're doing more and more of um, on top of just the core image data management. So classically, we've always managed um, diverse imaging data and metadata. So I mentioned this might be acquisitional metadata, but it's also going to be your experimental or clinical metadata. But I've, I've mentioned a couple of times this idea of analytical metadata. And so maybe you've segmented all the cells in an image or across an entire plate of images, um, and you want to manage that analytical data as well. This comes with some of the same uh, format diversity as the original images. It's not quite format diversity, but um, you might have produced analytical results in lots of different platforms. And so you want to bring all of that data into Omero and maybe not just the results of the analysis, but the parameters of the analysis so that you can recreate it. And so you can imagine that when you have a data management platform, and you start doing the kind of data science workflow, you want that data management platform to also support the management of the outputs of that analysis. And as I mentioned, also the parameters. And so um, those integrations are what we've actually spent a lot of time over the past couple of years um, doing with, with our customers. And so I'll show you some examples of that. And I'd also like to show you um, a roadmap of what's coming in the next year of new functionality that we're adding to that effect. So right now we already have an open API so that you can have a bi-directional integration with your LIMS software, um, image processing, statistical analysis, et cetera. Um, so that you can do that image analysis and read and write various kinds of data um, to Omero. We already support a number of third party um, integrations with uh, platforms that provide uh, various you know, segmentation or image analysis um, tools. So this includes things like Halo, Visio Farm, Cell Profiler, R, and others. This means that once that data is managed in Omero, you can explore your analysis results also from the browser. So you don't have to send you know, massive CSVs to your colleague. You can send them a link to a browser and so they can scroll through that data um, and the image that it was generated from. Uh, you can, because it's managed in Omero, you can use all of those multi-user and collaborative workflows that we support. So um, I mentioned that we have a nice permissions model that allows you to control sort of who has access to what and what they can do with that data. So that kind of multi-user workflow um, now also applies to all the analytical data that you've brought into Omero. Um, you can then mine through some of these results, and that's uh, some of the examples of what, what I'll show you in the roadmap, where you might be doing some uh, phenotyping or classification workflows of um, not only the images themselves, but now the things that you found within those images, so cells or tissue regions, 
Um, and you can do that in the context of Path Viewer and, and also in some other data mining tools um, that are coming in 2023. Um, and like I said, I'll show you those examples. Uh, you also might have more of a, a regulated workflow or a standardized workflow where you want to, at the end, export some report. This might be as simple as an export for your lab meeting, or it might be really a standard report that you have to generate um, that's kind of signed off on, and we support that kind of workflow in Omero as well. Okay, so like I said, I want to show you a little bit of a roadmap. Um, I'm actually going to start with some things that are um, currently at a few customer sites. Um, so this is already being used by a number of groups. Um, it's not as widely deployed as kind of the core software yet. So that's why I'm still showing it on our roadmap, um, but something that certainly is, is um, ready to try today. And this is data mining within Path Viewer itself. Um, by the way, I should mention that these roadmap slides, um, in addition to some others, were recently presented at the OME community meeting. So the open microscopy environment is um, kind of our sister group um, that uh, supports a lot of uh, these tools um, open source. And they have a community meeting every year. And this year it was divided across four days, um, the last day of which is tomorrow. Um, and we gave a presentation on the first day. All those meetings are recorded. And so if you'd like to see our whole presentation on our roadmap and actually what we've also spent 2022 doing, um, there's a lot of um, uh, different technical details that aren't included in this presentation. And so I invite you to, um, to view those uh, talks. And there's lots of other great talks, not just ours. Um, so lots of great content in those meeting recordings. Um, so in path viewer uh, what we're supporting is a data mining workflow within that image context or within the tissue context and so the idea is that you might want to visualize segmented objects overlaid with the original image of course and so that's what you see here um, is that segmentation overlaid with the um, underlying grayscale image uh, this image by the way is uh, collected from a rare site instrument called the orion um, it allows you uh, highly multiplex acquisitions here you're just seeing a single grayscale channel um, and so the nuclear segmentation is shown overlaid. And what you might want to do is start to filter or color those objects based on some features that you've calculated. And so here they're just color coded based on area grouped into three different groups. Um, you might have some much more interesting classification workflows that you bring into Omero. And so you could color code your cells or other objects um, based on those uh, measurements that you had of each of the objects. Um, this, uh, these object level measurements are driven by analytical data that is managed within Omero as well. Um, one example of that is called Omero tables. This is what it sounds like. It allows you to store tabular data in Omero. And uh, you can also visualize summary heat maps so that when you zoom out on a larger image, if you're no longer looking at that sort of single cell resolution, you can get kind of an overview of uh, particular hotspots for a given feature. Okay. So this is uh, data mining within the context of the tissue. Um, but another interface that uh, we are planning to release in 2023, so this is definitely um, a roadmap slide. The UI is probably subject to change. This is very much in kind of the discovery phase on our side. Uh, we don't, we aren't uh, giving this to customers yet. Uh, but this is a new mining interface called Omero Pageant. And the motivation for this interface is in some cases, you actually want to leave the tissue context. And so you really want to focus on the objects themselves. And this might be especially true if you're looking for rare populations. And so maybe there are 10 cells across the entire section of tissue that you expect to kind of pass through your filters. And in that case, you don't want to be kind of searching through the entire tissue context in order to find them. You just want to QC those cells kind of side by side one another. And so as you can probably see here um, in this top panel, you have a representation of your data table itself. Um, so here, let's say we just measured the probability in the area of each of the, in this case, nuclei that we segmented. But importantly, you see the nuclei themselves in a nice grid of uh, thumbnails side by side. And so if you have, you know, 10 uh, objects that kind of satisfy your filter, um, that's okay. You can, you can see them side by side. We do have an embedded version of Path Viewer here on the right. So just that center panel of Path Viewer. And that allows you to, um, if you say, ah, oh, this cell is actually quite interesting here, I want to see it in the context of the image, you can do that. And this viewer on the right will update to show you kind of the local tissue context of that particular cell. Um, and this is, again, a, an image from uh, Jerry Turner's lab at HMS. Okay. Great. So I'm going to now move into a demo of Omero Web and Path Viewer, just so you can see um, a little bit of how we work within that browser environment. Um, and then hopefully we'll have time for uh, any questions at the end. Okay. 
So I'm going to switch over to Amero Web. Um, this is one of our internal systems that we use for demonstration and testing. Um, and all the data sets here that I'll show are public. Um, so this is the core Omero web interface. Uh, this is where you log in and you can sort of navigate through your image data and its metadata to find uh, the images that you might want to say review on a given day. Um, so I'll show you a couple of examples of that. But I just wanted to find a couple of terms here. So I am logged in as a generic service account called import user. Um, you would log in and you would so I would see, you know, Aaron deal normally up here rather than a generic service account. And then um, this demo group here is the context in which I'm currently working in. And so this is how you can control uh, sort of who has access to what data. Um, one way is, is with this group context. And so you might have, for example, a group per lab at your institution. And so then all of the lab members are members of that group. And that means that they can, uh, for example, see each other's data. You also set that permission level at the level of the group. And so within uh, my lab, if I want everyone to be able to see each other's data, then I can set that permission. If I don't want people to see other other uh, other individuals' data, that's also okay. You can set a more restrictive permission setting, um, and you can even go so permissive to say that we can not only see each other's data, but we can even delete each other's data. That's usually um, not what we do. That's usually for kind of testing and demo groups uh, where you just know that every it's okay if everything is transient. Uh, kind of the happy medium and the permission level of this group is read annotate. It means that all the group members can see each other's data and they can annotate each other's data. So they can leave comments, they can make annotation, uh, region of interest annotations, they can make text-based annotations, but they can't delete anything. So if you have done work, I can't come in and delete or overwrite your work. Um, so it's a nice collaborative permission level without being uh, destructive or having the potential to be destructive. Um, but as I said, more permissive and more restrictive um, uh, permission levels are, are certainly available. So um, what you're seeing here is a project, uh, this bluish gray folder called demo, and then within that, a number of data sets, which are these greenish folders. Um, this is uh, the way that we organize um, typically uh, single images. So in this case, these are all whole slide images from the Cancer Genome Atlas. Uh, we also have plate-based organizations, and I can show you an example of that. Um, so there, there are different ways to represent more of that kind of structured acquisition like a plate uh, compared to single images um, like this collection of images from the Cancer Genome Atlas. If I select one of these images here, uh, for example, uh, I can see actually, let me click on uh, one of these. Yeah, okay, great. So um, we can see on the right hand side um, some metadata that we have for this particular image. Um, and so this, as I said, is from the Cancer Genome Atlas. So we have a name, uh, we have an image ID, we have the owner, we have some uh, scoring information, we have uh, this metadata that comes from the uh, kind of core acquisition metadata. So the acquisition date, the dimensions in X and Y, pixel type, pixel size, et cetera. Um, but we also have some more experimentally relevant metadata. Um, and so this is all again coming from the Cancer Genome Atlas. So we have a tag here and we have a dictionary of key value pairs that are a little bit more extensive. So um, for example, the year of birth, the uh, vital status, the uh, tissue origin, um, et cetera. And so uh, this in this case is all more clinically relevant metadata. Um, we also have a data set from the Atlas of Intestinal Transport. Um, that's the uh, data coming from uh, Harvard Medical School. And on this image, we similarly have tags and key value pairs, and they're more experimental um, in nature. Um, although I do, this is a clinical data set, but we have, for example, the antigen that was used on this particular uh, sample. And uh, that might be more uh, reflective of uh, more of a discovery-based workflow where you might be staining, in this case, they're staining a bunch of uh, tissue sections with a variety of different markers. Um, and, and of course, it's being used as a public reference data set um, in that case. And you can actually Google the Atlas of Intestinal Transport. It's a, it's a beautiful reference data set, larger than the selection that I have here. So what I want to do is I want to first just open up one of these images in the viewer. So I'm going to go back to the Cancer Genome Atlas first, and I'll just uh, choose one of these images. I can open it up. Um, so now we are in Path Viewer, okay? And um, I'll just uh, show you a couple of different examples here. So I already pointed out um, in the slides that we have the bird's eye view here on the right. We have some image info here on the right as well. Um, we have the uh, thumbnails here on the left with image names. And I just wanted to highlight that all the other thumbnails that you see in this particular example 
are all the other images from this data set. And so that's the default behavior of PathViewer is when you open up a single image, you see that image in the center, but you also see the other images from the data set um, in the left hand panel. Uh, you actually do have control over that. And this URL that you see here on the um, in the bar here at the top, that's actually shareable with your colleagues, of course. And what it contains are the uh, a number of parameters that tell PathViewer exactly what to show you. So it knows not only that this particular image is in the center panel, but as I start to zoom in, that URL is actually going to update. And it's updating in part to reflect the fact that I'm at a different zoom level and a different position within this slide. And so if you want to share this view of the slide with your colleague to get their feedback, uh, maybe a pathologist, then you can make sure that that is exactly the view that they see when they click on your link. You also might want to um, shift it so that there are, uh, you know, all of these images for your colleague to review as well. Or maybe you want to control that they should just review two or three additional images in this left hand panel. And so you can control exactly what's shown um, in this, uh, not only in the center panel, but also on the left hand side as well. OK. And so as you're navigating this image, this is where we're using that chunk based access. So we described that these data sets can be quite large. Um, this image, for example, is almost 100K by 25K. So it's quite large in the XY dimension. And um, as I so if I'm, say, all the way zoomed out when I first loaded the image, importantly, I can't appreciate the full resolution um, information in this image because I'm just not looking close enough at the sort of small uh, cells within this within this larger piece of tissue. And so in this case, the original file contains a pyramid of resolutions. Um, and so if you've ever uh, opened some of these files in various platforms where it will actually show you the structure of the file, you'll know this, but it doesn't just have the full resolution, um, you know, 90K by 25K um, array. It also has, has downsampled uh, versions of that same array. And importantly, we can use those downsampled uh, pyramid levels to know that if I'm all the way zoomed out in my viewer, I don't actually have to load uh, 100K by 25K pixels into the browser. I just have to load that downsampled version of the data. And so as you zoom in, it is dynamically loading the information that you need. So it's loading higher and higher resolution information and to the point where when you're all the way zoomed in, you have the full resolution information. Um, and I know that the navigation is not as smooth when sharing over um, over Zoom. So apologies for that. I'm trying to navigate a little bit more slowly. Um, but when I'm fully zoomed in, I see the full resolution information. But importantly, it's only loading the tile or tiles that I'm looking at. So you can get a sense of where I am in this bird I view and that means I don't have to load the full resolution information for the entire image but just for this part of the image that I'm currently looking at so that's how we are able to work with really massive data sets but still make them really responsive um, when looking at them in a viewer such as path viewer okay and so as I navigate through this image, um, I also might want to annotate this image. So I, I highlighted that there's already a lot of metadata on this image, um, but we might want to add some more. And so maybe I'm a pathologist and I'm coming in and I'm providing some um, annotations and maybe I'm uh, indicating to my colleagues the regions that I want to analyze in the future. I want them to analyze. And so in the top panel here, I have a number of different annotation tools. And so we can choose, for example, a freehand polygon and we can uh, choose a particular ROI style. So I can change, you know, the color. I can change the font color. I can uh, use a dashed line if I want to. So lots of different style options. I can choose a label. And so maybe I want to indicate that these are the regions to be analyzed, regions for analysis. And so I type that in as the label. Um, I might want to add a description, and so maybe I say um, this was uh, annotated on November 16th. Actually, the date of your annotation will be stored in the object anyway, but we can just uh, write a narrative here um, by Aaron Deal uh, during demo. So I add a nice description there so that someone knows what I was doing. And maybe I'm saying something important about this annotation. So uh, maybe this I have some staging information that I'm providing. Um, you know, you will have uh, particular kinds of metadata that you include in terms of uh, what goes into your downstream analysis. But here I'll just put you know a random stage number uh, to reflect kind of whatever kind of metadata you might add. And importantly, this is all metadata, not on the image now, but this is metadata on the region of interest. And so as I draw a particular ROI, 
Uh, now this ROI is one of my regions for analysis. And so it's here in my list. I actually have this little green icon to indicate that I not only have an ROI, but it has some of those uh, annotations or key value pairs on it. And so where I previously was in the details tab, I can now see that annotation here. And so um, this is a great way to um, assign metadata at the right level within the hierarchy of the data that you're managing. And so you probably have some clinically or experimentally relevant metadata that you want to attach to the image, but you might have others that actually apply to the particular ROI. So maybe you're highlighting a tumor region and the details of the kind of staging information or the um, uh, whatever kind of analytical data that you might write out are specific to that region and not to the overall image. Um, similarly, one thing that I didn't highlight back in Omero Web is that you can also attach metadata at the uh, data set level. And so if you wanted to add some key value pairs or some data set details, you could do that here um, within Omero Web. Um, so again, you can have metadata at the right place in this hierarchy rather than um, just at a single level, okay? So I am going to stay in Omero Web for just a second um, to kind of dig a little bit deeper into using um, that image level metadata in terms of finding the images that you might want to look at or annotate. So in that previous example, I just picked an image uh, somewhat at random. Um, and so what I what I want to do instead is uh, think about kind of mining through some of the metadata that I have in Omero to find the images that are of interest to me. And so I'm going to use an application called Omero Parade where I can use the metadata that's on these various images to look through um, and, and find the images that are most relevant. And so if I highlight one of these images, you can see that there are these four tags. Now, I didn't really highlight the difference between these tags and the key value pairs. The key value pairs are just a nice dictionary of metadata. Um, so, okay, what was the antigen used in this case? What was the biopsy site used? Um, but here, these tags are actually functional buttons within the user interface. So if I click on this patient ID 38, then it will bring me into this tags view. And I can see that patient ID 38 is a type of patient ID. Okay, no surprises there. And here I see all of the images that were tagged with patient ID 38. So these are uh, serial sections from the same tissue block and uh, all labeled with different uh, antibodies. And um, the nice thing about this is that this organization here is now completely independent of that project data set view where I had a bunch of images across different uh, patients, for example, in a single folder. Well, here I see them completely isolated in terms of all the images that came from patient ID 38 and it doesn't matter what data set they were in in the first place. Similarly, if I want to look at a particular biopsy site, I can do that as well. Um, and there are, for example, antigen, diagnosis, testing condition, tumor stage, etc. And so those tags give you kind of another view on your data, another hierarchy um, with which to organize your data. So I'm going to pop back to the Explore tab, um, back to my Atlas of Intestinal Transport, and back to my Omero Parade. And now I'm going to use those tags um, and other metadata to filter through and find the images that I want to annotate. So um, here you can add filters based on a number of different kinds of metadata. So um, you might want to see if they haven't been annotated before. Um, if someone has left, left a comment on the images, um, I'm going to use the tags that we just showed to filter them by a particular um, patient ID. So let's do uh, patient ID 33. And now I see a selection here. Um, so this might be if you're, um, say, a pathologist or a researcher and you know that uh, this particular uh, patient sample is ready for review, that might be one way to get to the images that you need to annotate. And I just want to quickly show an example of using um, Path Viewer Grid. So I'm just going to select uh, four of these images, open them up in Path Viewer Grid. Oh, sorry, I know that um, this is our, our demo system, so I know that it was a little bit um, under instruction. So there we go. Sorry. We were working on that linking between uh, Path Viewer Grid and not, so apologies for that. But now you see my four images in Path Viewer Grid. Um, I'm going to synchronize across all of these images. You can see that they just popped into place a little bit. That's because um, they're syncing based on the pixel size. And so if you have acquired different uh, areas in terms of the entire canvas of your um, scan area, uh, th that will probably always be true if you have two different images. Um, and so it will sync them based on pixel size and not based on the um, total dimensions in X and Y. And so now, um, just like in Path Viewer, I can zoom in and out 
and scan across the images, uh, pan across the images, excuse me, and I'm doing that in a synchronized way across all of these panels. Um, and so one more thing I just wanted to show in here is if I were to um, annotate one of these regions, and these are not perfectly um, synchronized in terms of their alignment, um, but I can annotate in one image and then copy and then paste to all here. Um, so if you do have serial sections or if you've done an alignment workflow, um, then you can have nicely aligned sections here and do uh, the annotations in one panel and then copy and paste them to all. So it really cuts down on some of the, the work to be done if you are annotating a number of images at one time. Um, one thing that I probably don't have time to show today, um, but is another useful case for Path Viewer Grid is if rather than having separate images that, that you want to view in Path Viewer Grid, let's say you have one of those highly multiplex data sets where you have tens of different channels, you can use Path Viewer Grid now to view one image, but copy it across all those different panels and you are turning on and off different channels within each of those views. And so you can imagine this is actually a single image across these four panels, but I have a subset of three to five channels turned on in each of those views, or even a single channel in grayscale turned on in each of those views. And it's a really nice way to navigate through these very um, rich data, single images um, and if you can't appreciate all 50 channels in one um, image viewer, which is normal for your visual system, uh, you can instead view them, view them in side-by-side uh, -side panels. Okay. So I think I will stop there because I do want to leave time um, for any questions. I'm happy to pull up examples of those highly multiplex data sets. I'm happy to pull up examples of plate data. Um, so I, I don't know if there are any questions relevant to those, but I will just err on the side of stopping now and seeing if there are any questions um, and not taking up too much time so that we can't discuss. Awesome. Well, thank you. And if anybody has any questions, drop them in the chat or the Q&A um, and we'll ask them along. Um, I mean, I got a question to kind of start with real quick. So you, you mentioned kind of the API documentation. So I'm always on the, the informatics side of things. Yeah. Um, is the API documentation, is that on like a GitHub that you guys have or something like that? Yeah, so um, it is all public and I can actually, actually grab you the link uh, really quickly. Um, so uh, Open Microscopy, their website, um, kind of hosts all of the public documentation for Omero. So I, I didn't completely dig into the details there, but we work really closely with the Open Microscopy environment. We are their exclusive commercial partner. Um, our CEO and founder, Jason Swedlow, um, also heads the Open Microscopy environment team. Um, and so these two teams kind of work in conjunction to support Omero in the wild. So open source Omero um, is being supported by the OME team and then Omero Plus, which is the commercial product is supported by the Glencoe team. Mm -hmm. um, but these two teams are, are kind of working really closely together. There's examples of that. Um, for example, if you're hunting through the bioformats uh, repos, um, you know, we see a lot of reports of various um, issues with bioformats readers when, you know, new versions come out on our side. And so we do that work, but then we'll push it back to the open source um, bioformat. So not everything we do goes back to the open source, but uh, the core of our platform is still um, everything that you find uh, with open source Omero. Okay, cool. Thanks. Yeah. So let me grab those docs. Okay. And in the meantime, if anybody has any questions, you know, feel free to drop them in the chat and Q and A, and we'll we'll answer. Great. So I will just send kind of the parent um, uh, developer docs um, that will sort of through all the documentation ultimately link to. Um, various APIs like MATLAB, Python, et cetera. Um, but that's a good place to start. Cool. Thank you. Well, hopefully for everybody who has tuned in, you can see the value of being able to access their imaging data anywhere and being able to share it amongst other people. So. Um, if anybody has comments or they think that this would be a great resource, we would love to hear from you so that we can pass this along um, to administration so we can, you know, try to, you know, obtain um, this technology here at NJMS.
So, oh, is there a hand up? Looks like it. Terminal. I can't see. It's oh, gone. No, it's gone. <laughs> okay. Well, there it is. <laughs> and it's back. Oh, Ayana. I don't know. Can you put your, is there a way to either let her unmute or yeah. can she just put it in the chat? Oh. Hi. Um, sorry, it seems like the chat is disabled. I tried to write in the chat, but uh, I wasn't able to. Uh, but uh, thank you so much. This was a, a beautiful presentation and I think it would be an extremely useful tool for us. Um, I, If you talked about it, I'm sorry I missed it, but uh, I um, don't know exactly how we would uh, do, let's say, colocalization studies. Uh, you talked about, you know, um, the images where we have multiple channels and all that. So, like, if we want to look at colocalization, would that be something that we do in a path view, or we would need to, uh, I don't know, use a different software uh, to achieve that? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, certainly, if you're in Path Viewer, um, you know you can view two channels um, or or multiple on at the same time and get a visual impression of uh, where those two channels are localized. But I think probably what you're referring to is a more quantitative assessment yes. of colocalization. And so um, there's a few different options. So let's say you're doing this in um, a platform like Python or MATLAB. You can use the Omero APIs to get the image data of interest and then perform your co-localization analysis. Um, if instead you're using something like, uh, let's say Fiji, there is a Fiji connector and, uh, or even um, uh, QPath, there are QPath connectors so that you can load your data in one of those platforms and then do your analysis from there. Um, the other option, and this is the way that we've connected with uh, some platforms like VisioFarm that rely on um, an actual copy of the file, is that Omero knows where the file is located. And so let's say that file is on some network storage and um, Omero knows where it is and Omero can communicate that to the end user or to the software platform, then you can interact with that original file in the way that you always have. Now, that relies on kind of the architecture of the setup and there's always, you know, institutional policies surrounding that, who is allowed to actually go interact with the original file. Um, and so those complexities aside, um, Omero could communicate to the end user, here's where the actual file is, now open it in whatever platform um, you prefer. So a lot of the answer to your question would depend on how what tools you're currently using to evaluate co-localization and where the data is kind of loca lo localized from an architecture point of view. Um, I will say that that's an important distinction in terms of where Omero Plus sits as a platform compared with things like QPath and Cell Profiler and VisioFarm is that we are not an image analysis platform. We are a data management platform and we enable image analysis because once you can find your images and have them associated with the right metadata and have them under the right permissions model, then you can use Omero to orchestrate image analysis in all sorts of interesting ways and also manage the output of that image analysis. But there's not, for example, um, kind of built into path viewer various analytical tools. I will say that we are getting closer to that with some of the data mining interfaces, but some of that core pixel math is still not something that's done within the browser. And really the reason for that is because we don't actually have the raw pixels in the browser. So maybe I'll just um, quickly share uh, one of these images again. So when we look at this particular image here, um, we actually don't have the raw pixels in the browser. We have a rendered view. And so when I, for example, turn off mCherry, um, there's a round trip to the server to get the new view here where I've just turned that channel off. A new rendered tile has arrived in the browser. Um, that being said, we have some you know, very basic tools like I have this nice pixel picker here where I can click on this pixel and see the intensities of each of those channels. Um, and so you could get an initial impression of kind of the, the local pixel values um, for that particular region. Um, but it's not quite the same as a desktop 
image analysis platform where you have all the raw pixels um, in hand and you can do that pixel math uh, kind of right there in the platform. And I think also like an important consideration is, you know, if there are plugins to like PG or all the other tools that you would normally use, like the advantage of this, especially like whether it's in your lab or you're collaborating across labs, right? If you throw your four color fluorescence in our new slide scanner, which can do a hundred slides in a run, right? Then you'll be able to store all this data. You're not going to have to worry about, oh, did somebody's hard drive crash? Like, do I have to bring a hard drive to the lab? If you're going to have a collaborator and maybe you took their tissues, you stained them, scanned them, you can just send them the link with the permissions to all of their images. They can use the plugin to analyze the data, right? There's, this just gives you so much more flexibility to be able to share, analyze, and even like just store your data. We do so much imaging in my lab that I'm sitting here looking at like, you know, multiple terabyte RAID drives. And that's how I have to store my data currently because that's the option that's available, right? So I wouldn't have to worry about, oh, I'm hitting like this capacity or I want to send something to a collaborator. It's just the fact that this would kind of be an all-in-one storage solution, but it's also tractable enough that you can employ the other ways that you're typically analyzing your data to this particular system. Yeah, it's a great point. We have a lot of groups who, for example, that step of sending uh, the data to a collaborator. So say before I do my analysis, whether it's co-localization or, or segmentation or whatever it might be, they want their collaborator to be the one to annotate the regions that are of interest for analysis. It's really challenging to send you know, terabytes worth of data to a collaborator, but as Karen highlighted, they can pop open a browser, annotate the regions, and then uh, those regions are immediately available to you via the API to then run your analysis on those regions. So it can certainly, now it's important to recognize the, the complexities of the permissions model that, you know, what should your collaborator have access to in addition to that one image? And so, you know, not trying to gloss over the um, complexities of those kind of data sharing um, requirements from a policy perspective, but, um, I think we can all see the advantages of working in a browser environment for, you know, sharing data, making annotations, um, and having that really collaborative uh, data workflow. Any other questions? Doesn't look like we have any more, but uh, if anybody has any further questions, you can feel free to reach out to Aaron directly. Um, obviously, Luke and Karen in the in the cellular imaging and histology core, um, and we can get everyone connected to answer those questions. Yeah, our website is glencosoftware.com. Um, we have uh, forms on there and also info at glencosoftware.com. You can reach out to us. Um, I also want to highlight that we are hiring right now. So if you're so excited by all this stuff that you are interested in for, you know, at the end of your postdoc, thinking about your next step, um, you know, certainly reach out to us. We have uh, a couple of applications positions and a community manager position that we're hiring for. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you very much for a great presentation and thank you everyone for being here today. And uh, yeah, have a great day. Thanks everyone. Appreciate the time. Bye.